But there are still seeds of division already planted, and, and the inaugural poem itself sort of hints at that, that we're not quite there yet. Our democracy is still this incredible work in progress, right? It's still a great social experiment, and that a, a democracy is not it's not a noun, it's a verb. It's something we have to constantly work at. Uh, in 2023, Richard Blanco was awarded the National Medal, uh, Humanities Medal by President um, Biden from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And it gives us a perfect opportunity as uh, a son uh, born uh, in Cuban roots, uh, living in South Florida, uh, an excellent opportunity for us to talk about uh, all of the intersections of what we're going and watching going on in our world. So I welcome Richard Blanco to Unapologetically Queer, and, and I understand you are unapologetically queer. Is that correct? Pretty much, <laughs> I love the term. I love the I love the the, the title of of all this. But yeah, not always, of course. Uh, a different generation. It was very apologetic, obviously, growing up. <laughs> yeah, the big news uh, this year, uh, of course, is uh, President uh, uh, Biden uh, presenting you with the National Humanities Medal uh, from the National uh, Endowment of the Humanities. Uh, when you got the news that you were going to be uh, presented uh, that honor and by President Biden, what was your reaction when you first heard? Well, of course, incredibly honored, um, especially because um, historically, it's sort of a lifetime achievement award, and like you know, usually in the past, it's you know people don't get that that kind of medal to like they're seventy or something like that. So, um, so I was thrilled on that end, but also as I'm thrilled even with receiving the news back in 2012 with the White House, I just uh, always think of my family, my community, everything that I represent, uh, my queer community, uh, my immigrant community, and knowing that um, you know that it's that that honor is not just for myself but for all of us uh, and to represent that is always a really special uh, feeling and 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 a, and a great charge to have you know um, uh, having recognition and having an, a lifetime achievement award uh, as you said the medal represents and and you're definitely not in your 70s um, uh, to have <laughs> one recognition from one person of the United States is uh, amazing, and it's always amazing. But to be recognized twice in 2012, you're the uh, poet uh, laureate for um, the presidential inauguration of the second uh, term for President Obama. Uh, I remember watching that moment, and uh, and we, uh, many of my friends in in queer community, talked about the representation of you doing that. What? What was that like for you first, just um, as, as poet, to be able to participate in the inauguration of such a historic moment of, of the blackness and the representation of, of how change was going on in America? What was, what was that like for you? Um, again, like it's, it's such an incredible honor, but it also so much bigger than yourself. And um, uh, a lot of times, people ask me, you know, was I nervous? You know, reading in front of a million people <laughs> at the mall and forty million across the world. And um, my answer is like, at that moment, you realize that. Um, I wasn't as nervous as you would think because at that moment you feel like you're something much larger. You feel like you're part of something much larger than yourself. Um, uh, you know, just what the community, how all the, you know, it's almost reverent. Uh, you feel like you're in service. Um, you know, it's not even about the president. It wasn't even about Beyonce that <laughs> she was. She was. She sung the national anthem. We really all feel this incredible sense of service and representation. I will tell you a little anecdote that really brought it home. Um, um, I was asked to attend the HRC ball, um, and uh, my publicist at the time said I couldn't attend, but they all they all planned to serve surprise uh, the whole party and so I showed up on stage and they put on you know the, the clip from that day and that's when it really hit home started cheering and I just I just really realized at that moment like 
some person is reading this poem to the entire country and he's gay yeah. <laughs> and it's me yeah. and uh, and i remember that in the president's speech he said for the first time he equated uh the lb uh, our, our cause to a civil right to a civil rights cause to a human rights cause yeah. um and that was the first time any president had ever said that so yeah. um so all that anyway that's when it really hit me and i was like my family <laughs> and that <laughs> and representation I, yeah yeah I, i'm curious and to be loved to be loved you know and and, and love back it was just it's so amazing i'm curious richard uh, uh i was going to talk about this a, a little later but since you bring bring it up president obama uh came to gay marriage later uh, you know he famously said uh i had to evolve in my understanding of uh, lgbt and and then um he makes the equation that lgbt is like civil rights and that it is a a process of uh, moving forward we didn't know when you were reading the poem on the national mall for the 2012 inauguration that the clock was starting to tick down to three years before gay marriage uh recognition uh, you think about it uh, 10 years ago of that moment for you and all of the incredible achievements that have been ha that have occurred in the last decade, but also also the incredible frightening issues that we've seen in politics and attack on LGBT. Um, uh, the 2017 inauguration, a bit different uh, than the one previous that you got to participate in. What do you think about um, the world uh, that we're watching and the politics of, of what's happened in the last 10 years since you were on the National Mall uh, reading uh, a poem in front, as a gay poet, in front of 40 million Americans? Uh, where do you think we are today and well, why do you think we're here yeah i've something i've obviously thought about and especially compared right um you know things i mean things were certainly much better back in 2013 but there were still seeds of division already planted and and the inaugural poem itself sort of hints at that that we're not quite there yet and one of one of the lessons i learned uh well not a lessons but one thing that really struck uh, a realization rather was that our democracy is still this incredible work in progress right it's a, still a great social experiment and that a, a democracy is not it's not a noun it's a verb it's something we have to constantly work at and so while i wish things were different it's also lit a fire under my butt so to speak um there's something you know to get back and 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 as i did when i was much younger and think about um and think about what I can do to participate, to help, to represent, um, to make sure we don't take 20 steps back again. Um, it's difficult, but um, I'm an I'm, I'm internal optimist and a, sort of a little bit of a Pollyanna, but uh, I'm always hopeful. But uh, where I am right now is, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm grateful for the fight, but um, but I'm, 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 I, it's, you know, we got to show up and, and I think it's especially important as an older, uh, uh, LGBTQ, uh, part of the, part of, uh, our community as an older member to really bring up, uh, pull forward our younger community so that, you know, they fortunately maybe, I think, uh, may have not had to go through what we've gone through in early years. And I think we can serve as mentors for them and thinking about, hey, we've been through this before and it's not pretty <laughs> uh, if we go back 20 steps, right? Um, like coming out in high school in my day and age was a wasn't even a possibility right it wasn't even a, a thing it just didn't happen so i think you know we have to we have to you know batten down the hatches so to speak and um that's what i'm trying to do by uh using the platforms i have these incredible honors to continue to continue or pick up the fight rather it's not it's never it's never really has ended right you know uh one other thing that i'm i'm curious of that's uh that's your observation of comparing and contrasting is doing uh, uh, the, the, the poem that you did for the inauguration uh, for the second uh, term for President Obama. Um, you are a professor at Florida International. Uh, you uh, live here in uh, South Florida. Um, I'm curious about what you think about what we're watching in, in Florida and, and from, from an artist perspective, a writer's perspective, uh, 
uh, the history of what we're watching. Uh, uh, you are in Miami-Dade County. I want to talk about your Cuban roots in a, in a moment, but we watched, um, uh, you know, with the pie in the face in the 1970s, uh, Vanita Bryant and, and what we're going through today uh, for LGBTQ. What do you think about what we're watching in Florida? Any, any eye or observation or great words there? <laughs> well, I um, I think it's fairly obvious what's happening. Um, it does echo back when you're talking about my uh, immigrant roots and my parents' stories about communist Cuba and sort of the tactics and uh, the banning of books and the uh, this. Uh, it's gotten very bad, especially in the, in the educational world. And I'm not, I'm sure every, every professor is feeling terrified about academic freedom, but like, for example, there's a, you can report somebody anonymously for, you know, doing this or doing that. And, and it reminds me of my, the stories my parents would tell me about your own neighbor would accuse you of something and suddenly you were in trouble and had to show up and, um, and whatever, clear your name or not, or, or whatnot. So it's scary for me uh, on that level because it's sort of like, I know a little more inside story from, from what my parents have been through. Like I said, um, um, you know, there's, uh, it's so draconian and it's, and, and it's so like attacking, uh, of course, you know, the education system is a way of controlling things. Um, um, for me personally, um, you know, I think like what happened at the new school and people are leaving and professors, I can't say that I, it hasn't crossed my mind. Um, you know, it in the even when I be, from the time I began at, at FIU, um, things have changed radically. Um, uh, and so I thought of like, why am I doing this? And, um, and I'm, I answer myself saying like, no, that's exactly what this, this, these people, this system wants to get out of there. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm going to stay. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to keep on uh, pushing back and fighting this. Um, and I think, again, it's sort of given me some kind of purpose or a, additional fuel, additional fire into my butt uh, to keep on remembering that we can't take our, our rights uh, for granted. Um, but it's it's sad. It's and and on so many levels, um, you know, and and different communities and groups that, um, you know, this creating a white Christian state. Um, I just I never thought I'd see that happen. Um, and, and and I think it's ironic, especially in Miami Dade, because I think a lot of the supporters of this. Um, whatever you want to call it, this agenda. administration, <laughs> this agenda and this administration, they don't really see that, I, you know, at some time, at some point they're coming for them too. Um, yeah. You know, you know that there's that famous quote, a uh, poem that I can't remember now um, uh, that said, you know, first they came for X and, and I didn't say nothing. For, then they came for Y and they didn't say something. Then they came for Z and I didn't send. And then, and then the final line is, then they came for me and there was nobody left to yeah. speak up. Yeah. And yes. I think I, I fear Miami is such a cultural capital um, that they're not understanding that all these, all these, all these rules and laws and bills are really at the end decaying, uh, are going to really chip away at our city, at, yeah, our, at our county. It's and it's at, at Fort Lauderdale too. Yeah. It's yeah. Everything. And I'm in Fort Lauderdale and Broward County is facing the same kinds of situations. I want to talk a, a moment about uh, South Florida. Uh, and then I do want to talk about Cuba. Um, Florida International University is interesting to me um, because uh, I repeatedly read uh, that with a gigantic, gigantic student population, it is the most culturally diverse, ethnicity diverse uh, university in America. And of course, makes perfect sense in Miami-Dade County. Um, but it's interesting in all of the fight and all of the argument that is going on in Florida, we are watching a, a radical conservative and a radical evangelical rejection of diversity. And at the end of the day, they're rejecting the basic concept of why Florida International University is so great, is the, the diversity. And you represent that. I, I was reading that your, your mother uh, was seven months pregnant. Um, uh, family um, uh, exiles out of Cuba, goes to Madrid, and eventually 
to New York. Tell me a little bit, uh, obviously, in South Florida, for those that haven't spent much time in South Florida, our uh, Latino community and definitely our Cuban community here in South Florida is so rich and so diverse. Tell me a little bit about uh, your feelings about uh, Cuba and and the, the diversity that uh, you represent in community. Sure. I should, I should mention too that um, I'm a two-time graduate from FIU, so I'm a product of that, that same diversity. And also uh, how the community it serves, which is a lot of working class kids, just like, like I was. Uh, so I got my engineering degree and my creative writing degree from FIU. So being there is even more special to me because it's a way of giving back. So, and a special connection, but um, yeah, um, you know, uh, I think it was our, our Pulitzer Prize winning uh, uh, columnist from the Miami Herald years years and years ago, uh, Lisbon Mosela said, we love living in Miami because it's so close to the United States. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and you don't so need great. a passport, you know? That's so, a great thing. so um, you know, I, I, uh, I've thought a lot about it and it's a lot, it's a lot of it is in, is in my, in my, comes through in my poetry and it's the major topic and theme of my po poetry home place belonging so i uh, i mean the way i describe growing up in miami was like growing up between two real imaginary worlds one of course is the the world of cuba and not just my family but also the whole community at large of um you know this mythical place this wondrous place that we're going back to this place that i belonged to, to or came from but i wasn't even born there um so it felt real and yet it was very imaginary and then the other sort of real imagined world was america or the united states because clearly 90 percent of my you know my classmates all from kindergarten on were pretty much like me you know i children of exiles so there was this mythical america in, in terms of all the tv shows and um foods and commercials and things like that that we you know i you know you know american cheese was like like a thrill for me whenever my parents would get it for us so and i love that i i love that miami exists between these two worlds and i think it's even it's even more so now um back then it was diverse but again i think it was a far majority of Cuban and Cuban exiles and children of Cuban uh, parents. And what I love how the city has flourished to be much more pan-Latino yeah. and much more diverse in general. Yes. Um, yeah. And it does feel like there's few cities in the world where you feel like there's like you are in this place one of them of course is uh new orleans right like and it usually happens with when you have a confluence of all these different cultures that create a new a new sense of place um um so i love that about the city i have to say that i've ran away from miami twice because i did want to also explore you know what is this real america in my mind and now i'm and and i got angry at miami for a while because it had changed so much and group so big but now i came back about four years ago really loving it and accepting uh, it's like this big grown-up city um and that's one and about cuba um you know i uh i visited cuba for the first time in 1994 um i, I had started writing about you know cultural identity and negotiation of identities and um and so naturally i felt i had to go to cuba and my mother's entire family stayed in cuba all her eight brothers and sisters her parents so I had this huge family in cuba and that was an amazing sort of um filling in so many blanks of things that were just stories and anecdotes and letters that came from cuba and black and white photos that they would send and then finally um i loved the experience but i also felt like as it is now, it's really hard to have a relationship, an intimate relationship with the island. There's so much political jazz, but it's just so hard to even get there and expensive. And you always live in a little bit of fear when you're visiting because, you know, you know, you you carry your parents' fear of I'm not going to be arrested at any moment. Um, and so I realized that the Cuba that I that real imaginary place sort of still stays somewhat in my imagination because it's really the Cuba of my parents and grandparents and their stories. And it's still there in part, but it, it was, it was a different, it's a different Cuba and, and it is its own country in its own way that kept on evolving past, you know, what I, what I know it to be through my parents' uh, stories and my community stories. Your, um, your, I think. I, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Oh no. And I just think that, um, you know, uh, I mean, there's other thoughts on that, but, um, um, 
you know, I, I also uh, was asked to write a poem and read it, uh, recite it at the uh, reopening of the U.S. Embassy in Cuba. And I thought this is the final sort of the, the, the beginning of this lifting what I call the emotional embargo, because besides the economic embargo, there's a lot of complex layers of pain and hurt and a lot of psychology going on that I think our community needs to heal um, and, and get through. Um, and um, so, you know, it's Cuba's always been a difficult, you know, just when you think you're getting close where things are going to change, then, the, you know, they close the embassy and all this stuff. So um, it's something I think about a lot. And, and but I'm also sort of realizing now at 55 that, you know, this is ultimately my home, uh, this country, and especially Miami. And Cuba feels a little further and further away uh, yeah. with each time. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Your your family from Havana or where in Cuba? No, they're from um, they're from uh, primary, uh, uh, there's a city on the southern coast that's called um, City of uh, Cienfuegos, and my first book is actually called is named after the city, which is City of a Hundred Fires, so Cienfuegos. Yeah. Uh, so there, it's a uh, beautiful more more influenced by the French because they used to trade with New Orleans a lot, uh, but they're in and around the whole family is scattered around all the towns, sugar mill towns that surround that that major city. Oh yeah, yeah, there it is. Yeah, <laughs> I've been to Cienfuegos many times. I, I know the city well. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, the LGBT intersections of, of uh, your place uh, uh, as, uh, as a writer, artist uh, in Cuba and, and Miami-Dade County. Now we've watched, um, uh, we, we brought the show uh, to uh, Havana Pride in May of uh, 2019, and um, and uh, I've been to Cuba more than a dozen times. We've watched a transformation in Cuba for LGBT rights, setting aside all of the politics for a moment, uh, and the specific uh, queer community in Cuba, uh, marriage recognition, the national referendum, other kinds of things. What do you think about uh, LGBT rights in, in Cuba? What, uh, what, what observation do you have of what we've seen over the last number of years? Um, you know, I haven't, um, it's interesting because I haven't really tracked that a lot, mostly because when I go to Cuba, I'm living with my family and El Campo, you know, in the countryside. And I have, like absolution uh, or can't connect with any kind of recognizable LGBT community. Like things that if, uh, you know, uh, I forget uh, Fidel Castro's uh, daughter, right? Um, Mariella. Opening up. So um, I think it's Mariella, right? And I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I find I'm still skeptical because there's so many, there's so many limits on rights, but but it's it seems to be authentic, and um, I'm glad for it. But you know, it's as it is in most of Latin American countries, um, or at least Central American and uh, Caribbean. It isn't gay, or the community isn't like how we understand it in the United States. Or it's like you can go to Havana and pick up, you know, a, a gay river rag and see where the coolest, you know, gay club is. Yeah, um, right. And I found that that that's partly cultural, and it's not just because of the communist regime but even when you go to like parts of mexico or uh you know outside of mexico city it's not like a plug and play and and i've spoken about this in in several uh countries and they look to the united states as a model of like how did you do this how can we do this you know how 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 does this work how do we you know and again i think it's it there's idiosyncrasies about the culture that, you know, we can talk about machismo, every culture has machismo, you know, but, um, and, but also on the, on the other sense, at least with Cubans, I'll speak for Cubans, um, and referring back to Reynaldo Arenas, who's sort of a, <laughs> the, the author um, and poet who really dove into sort of the the gay world in, in, in Havana in particular. Um, it's, and he calls it, it's, it's one of the gayest countries in the world. Yeah. It's like so homoerotic. Yeah. Um, and because of the very machismo, which is interesting and ironic. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that, 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 you know, I, I, you know, I, again, I think the changes are authentic, I guess. Um, but I do find it ironic that on the other hand, they're limiting, 
you know, they're cracking down on so many other rights. Um, so There's contradictions yeah, I, I, there in terms of how they deal with LGBT versus uh, civil and political rights. Right. It's very interesting. And, and, and the record back, you know, in the day of like during the AIDS crisis that they put all, everybody in camps. And so, so yeah, terrible. But maybe it's Mariela, Marianela, who, you know, has, um, has a different view. Um, yeah. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is the intersection of, uh, and you, you touch on it, and I know uh, in representing your Cuban roots, but, uh, but I want to talk about Latino in general. Well, we're big advocates. Uh, we do a, a, one of our 10 pillar missions is for Latino uh, LGBTQ plus community. Uh, we're big supporters of the Gay Ocho Festival, which is the largest diversity LGBT uh, Hispanic festival in America. Um, how do you think um, uh, South Florida, Miami-Dade County, uh, but ge in general, how do you think uh, Latino community is doing on LGBT? Uh, it always seems to be a bit contradictory to me, so it's an excellent opportunity to ask from your eye, what do you think? Yeah, um, I think um, there's something I, I've talked, I mean, thought about a lot and also it's in my poetry it's it's something i call cultural sexuality right that the intersection of these two things and that um you know that you can't sort of separate those things because they affect how you how you think of yourself how you think of your community how you think yourself as a gay man um and so one of the things again it is that sense of of machismo which is I don't want to speak for every Latin American country, but the idea being that it's about uh, pretense or appearance, right? So like my grandmother used to say, well, many of uh, many in the community would say, es mejor serlo y no parecerlo que parecerlo y no serlo, which is, which is to say it is more honorable to be gay and not act gay than it is to act gay uh, even if you're not gay. <laughs> so, so the idea being wow. that, that's yeah, and, and I think that affects, you know, our our sensibility of um, being more forthright and open just in general in our everyday life. Um, it's really about the, the crime is, at least for a gay man or even for a gay woman, is to not be heteronorm or, or appear heteronormative. To, the crime is, you know, to be feminine. Uh, because in a, in a hyper machismo culture, you know, that is the crime. So, you know, my mother has told me stories about like, you know, as long as you're married and pretend and like <laughs> you have kids, <laughs> nobody cares. <laughs> but like, my mother tells me like, oh, you didn't know your uncle, whatever was gay. He's like, I'm like, no, she's, I, I never forget one time she told me, yeah, even his wife knows. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I, it's, it's a, it's a little messier and blurrier, um, in the ways that, you know, we, uh, and I think something else happens too, right? When you are come as, as an immigrant, right. Or you grow up in an immigrant culture as, you know, it's a hyper, it's just exact, it's, it becomes an exaggeration of your culture because, I always say Miami is more Cuban than Cuba because you want to celebrate and make sure you don't lose that culture. And so having to, you know, traditions are great, cultural attachments are great, but they're also very limiting. But I think since since that is such a presence uh, for immigrant and new communities, then there is that, you know, I can't break free from the tribe and be this kind of person. I think that also complicates things for us yeah, culturally. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Richard, I want to uh, I want to first apologize to you. I did not know until I preparing uh, this interview uh, with you uh, that you are the first ever poet laureate of Miami Dade County. I just cannot believe <laughs> this gay man in Miami Dade County is the first poet laureate uh, for Miami Dade County. You have congratulations. We love Thank that. Uh, we share on that honor uh, in the entire LGBTQ community in South Florida, especially. Um, you have a, uh, as Poet Laureate, uh, you have a uh, poetry uh, project called Miami's Favorite Poems Project. Tell us a little bit about that platform and how, how it works and, and what's it designed to do? Sure. So, um, um, first, I, I should say that, um, you know, growing up working class, immigrant, my parents didn't speak English, I had very little access to the arts and humanities and like we didn't even have books at home so as i become a poet i always i always look to um i look to see how um i can 
uh, create more and more access uh, to the arts, the humanities, the poetry in particular. It's a big sort of self-imposed mission because I want a little kid have that earlier in life, um, contrary to what's happening in the state of Florida. Um, so, so this is a. I wanted to do something that was inc very inclusive, that involved community, that involved everyday folks. And the project, uh, I got to give uh, honor where honor uh, uh, credit where credit is due, was a project that Robert Pinsky, our, our former U.S. poet laureate, started. Uh, maybe 15 years ago. And the idea is that, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I don't get poetry, I don't read poetry. But then you ask them, do you have a favorite poem? And nine times out of 10, they will have a poem that has stuck with them most of their life or all their life that has something meaning and has changed their life in some significant way from a fireman to like a bank teller to, you know, all walks of life. And so the idea is to people, for people to, um, it's at uh, miamiday.gov backslash or forward slash poetry, and you upload your, the, your favorite poem and your backstory of how that poem came to be. And so we want to create this archive of these beautiful moments of storytelling that revolves Miami. And I don't want, and I want to say, it's not just Miami-Dade, anybody who has an emotional connection to South Florida, uh, you know, like it's really bigger than, you know, the Miami-Dade border because so many of us live elsewhere, um, but also have Miami roots and even, you know, brother and sister, or sister and sister, whatever, uh, with Fort Lauderdale and Broward County. So, uh, yeah, that's the idea. And then we do community events. Uh, we're going to have actually, hopefully, and um, I don't want to say too much, but we're going to have a meeting of uh, favorite poems from Broward County and Miami-Dade County. Oh, and sort of excellent. Little, that's a great. little mashup. That's mash right. Mashup with that. Excellent. And, we, uh, we, always, we always play with the competitiveness between Miami-Dade and, and Broward County. Uh, I live in uh, Broward County. We have the preeminent gay community at Welton Manors in Fort Lauderdale. Right. And, and y'all, you know, you, you have some gay people down there in Miami-Dade County too. But uh, we also, uh, we always make the joke if we come down for events and activities in Miami-Dade County, um, it, it takes a long time to get down there because uh, we have to bring our passport and we have to go through passport control to cross <laughs> the, the, yeah. the county yeah. line. You know? Well, uh, some of these things where we actually do community events where the, the people come and share live. And uh, we've done two, one at the Miami Book Fair and one at uh, a library in Pinecrest. And so we're thinking of, we're thinking of maybe doing a pop-up tent right on the county line or oh, something. Oh, that, that, that would be absolutely make, awesome. And the illustration would be fair. hilarious. Uh, Richard, if, if, um, uh, if, if you, uh, in, in your go forward with the project, make sure you uh, talk to us because uh, we're a big supporter and sponsor of the Miami Book Fair. Um, we do a, a line program that we do in broadcast called the LGBT um, uh, band book club, and we've talked about to oh. dozens of uh, authors around the country uh, facing the book bans and and the issues that uh, they are facing. Uh, we're we're a big supporter of uh, the written word and the value of the written word. And so, uh, uh, as you. your projects unveil, please uh, make sure you reach out to us. The one thing I do want to ask you about in terms of. Uh, poetry and and uh, like this project that you just talked about in Miami. How does LGBT interact for you here in South Florida and generally about LGBT? Uh, you know, we're we're all about our music. We're all about our theater. We're all about our dance. We're all about our our parties. How are we about uh, our written word and and poetry? LGBT. Well, I mean. Um... I can't, I'm not sure at large, um, but I know that from the, the students that come through my classrooms, um, uh, poetry, whether, I mean, it's it's a way of processing things. It's a way of um, really understanding oneself. And I got to say, um, you know, I don't think I, I don't think I would have come out when I did if I hadn't started writing because writing creates an introspection. It also creates community because when you start sharing, parts of yourself, you make connections and realize, oh, there's other gay people around me. So um, I, you know, poetry is always sort of, uh, it's always, it's always had, you know, it's always been the the ugly stepsister, so to, so to speak, but it's there. I think, I think we, we appreciate it. I think, um, you know, in general, you know, our communities support all kinds of arts. Um, but I would say, you know, it's important because, not a, not and not just in particular to LGBT 
to rights and and whatnot because i i think what poetry does and what other arts do is to put real names and faces and lives to issues that sometimes get abstract um or abstracted or um are just you know um twisted politically and when someone bears witness through a poem whether you're writing it or whether you're listening to it um it really it really can affect us um and it um it can help also galvanize us um if we if we think about what a poem can do and how it can make us think and 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 prop us up and, and motivate us and also uh connect and not feel so alone um um that's part of what the 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 meetups or the community readings of favorite poems projects are to realize you're not alone, right? You're not alone in these feelings. You're not alone in uh, these these uh, these uh, uh, problems. These things you want to take up, and you find you find strength and support. So, um, I think you know um, there's a long history of of gay poets as well that we can we can look at. You know, one of our one of the things we have obviously a lot of problems, not problems with, but you know, it's hard. It's hard to maintain our history or to give people a history other than Stonewall. You know, and so I reading po gay poets like Adrian Reich and and whatnot. You know, give us a sense that we've been here. I mean, Whitman was gay, right? So we've been here for a while, and we've been right. representing in literature. and And I think that's another way of thinking about it. Um, one of our anchors, I remind viewers, one of our anchors, Greg Shapiro, eight uh, books of poetry featured. Uh, this year at the uh, an award uh, recipient at the Miami Book Fair. Every month he hosts at uh, Bona on Wilton Drive um, a poetry event uh, for LGBTQ yes. community, and we invite you to participate in it. Uh, Richard, I, I appreciate you saying what you said because uh, I have always believed that written word and poetry uh, can be as an important activist tool for LGBT as as marching in the street because it can uh, generate an emotional response. I wanted to ask yeah. you in terms of uh, multiple books that you've written, uh, uh, new projects, you'll you'll be coming back to uh, Florida International in the fall. Um, any new projects that we should be aware of? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, I did, uh, before we leave the, the, the last question, I, I just realized um, I've done a poem for Freedom to Marry. Uh, oh. And uh, so poetry also helps. I've, I've been helping like organizations by using those, vo by lending my voice and my talent and whatnot to, to helping them do what they do, which is they can do it better than I can do it. Um, a few years ago, Sam Adams for their LGBTQ, for their Pride Month campaign asked me to write a poem and they filmed it at Stonewall. It was, it was amazing what they did. Um, and I wrote a poem for Pulse um, that is part of the, part of, uh, hopefully even be part of the memorial there. So, so I just want to say that I firmly believe what you just said as well. And I try to, whenever I can, I try to, put that poetry out there so that helps us think about ourselves and reflect on ourselves. Um, new projects, very exciting. I have a uh, the second production of a play I wrote with uh, Vanessa Garcia, co-wrote with Vanessa Garcia, is going to uh, debut at the um, Actors Playhouse, which is the old Miracle Theater on yeah. a Miracle Mile, and that'll be November 3rd, so we're very excited about that. Um, uh, it's called... Uh, Sweet goats and blueberry senoritas, um, <laughs> and and it, there's a gay character in there, uh, <laughs> of course, <laughs> and uh, it really talks about place, home, and belonging, and identities of, and how we come together to understand each other, um, and the families that we form, um, and the communities that we form. So in that way, I feel like it's it's gayer than most people think because you know when we have to form our own families is when we come out and we have to form our own communities and sort of you know just re-socialize re ourselves in a different way um so that's exciting i'm also working uh on a musical um gay gotta do a musical <laughs> uh, <laughs> right not, just as a co-lyricist though i can't i can't please even play a bongo um uh and it deals with uh it's called uh waiting for snow in havana it's based adaptation of the famous book by Car carlos aire of uh that 
details his uh, fleeing Cuba uh, with through the Operation Peter Pan, which was the airlifting of children, um, 14,000 children. It's the largest airlift in the Western Hemisphere of children um, that came without their parents. And the hope was that the parents would be able to get out. And so a lot of them did, but uh, a lot, some didn't. And it's a lot spent years without their parents. You wouldn't think that's part <laughs> that's part and parcel for a musical, but it's a different kind of musical. Yeah, uh, so, so that's exciting. I also and understand in, you have a new book coming. Yeah, in October I have a. Uh, uh, October 24th. Uh, you can pre-order if you like. <laughs> uh, it's called yeah, Homeland of My Body, and it's new and selected, which means I, I put in about 30 new poems, so it's not a full collection of new poems, and then selections of all my four books in between uh, those years. And it really tells the journey of what is the main theme of my home is how, you know, what is home? How do we find that? And home to me is also, in a sense, one of the homes I found was you know, home in the sense of safe space and community uh, when I did come out, right? It's another kind of home. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a, it's, you know, it's not a country, but it is, it's like, a, it's a connection. It's a psychological home uh, that we all belong to. And um, so that's part of the search that I, I think is about home too. And that's in there. A lot of love poems for uh, my husband and a lot of breakup poems from my mid twenties. <laughs> uh, 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 that's funny. And uh, your new book uh, through Amazon or where do you recommend uh, getting it? Um, you can get it uh, anywhere, of course, but uh, it is published through Beacon Press. So, Beacon. you know, that's the best place to get it. Um, and um, or any of those indie, you know, indie uh, sites that, you know, I can indie bound, right, where they yes, all conglomerate all the and mm -hmm. of course, books and books. <laughs> yes, books and books. Exactly. We'll, we'll be having a big debut there on December 2nd. Oh, excellent. Well, uh, and we also want to uh, drive my goodness, as you can tell in this uh, a uh, short uh, review of Richard Blanco. There is a lot here, and you can get uh, many more details by going to his website, richard-blanco.com. There's lots of information there uh, and see a uh, storied history as uh, our poet laureate of Miami-Dade County, but also he did this little tiny thing in 2012 by being poet laureate of the uh, inauguration of uh, uh, President Obama, and then this year being recognized by President Biden as the National Humanities Medal winner presented by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, what an amazing uh, achievement. And uh, uh, when you come back to South Florida, we for sure uh, would like to talk to you more. You're, you're just right over the border uh, from us here in Fort Lauderdale and Broward County. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, Pat, I'll make sure you, that you don't have to bring a passport. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Richard uh, Blanco, uh, thank you so no, much. No, this for... has been great. And, and I, I'm just... No, I'm just saying, I'm due for a visit to Wilton Manors. It's been a while. So, like, Exactly. Everyone should come I, I, to Wilton I need, Manors. I need to get my... my... I need to get my gay license renewed. <laughs> yes, exactly right. It's time for that uh, to be renewed. Uh, Richard Blanco, thank you so much for being with us today on Unapologetically Queer. Thank you. It's been great.